he he joined us at the at the desk so that was fun to talk to him did i see i think i saw him out your window wandering around out there yeah. he's in the shop right now he's uh, um, working on Cybertruck today oh yeah sweet i saw that and i haven't seen uh, i don't think i've seen any content on that but i've seen it in the backgrounds of something or other so yep. that was cool yeah so uh our goal right now for the cyber truck is to get it self-driving um nice. so we're putting gps on it we're putting uh, machine vision on it and hopefully we'll be able to like summon it to any location on the property and then you know put stuff in the back of it and go say okay go to the the garage and it'll just be able to drive itself there Delivery. fully autonomously exactly. is it an actual cyber truck or is it a clone or i haven't seen anything about it yet yeah so our cyber truck it is kind of a clone the mm -hmm. uh the cool thing about it is it's half scale so it's the size okay. of, a, of a golf cart basically sweet um it's uh, half the length, half the width, and half the height. Can fit two people. But the cool thing about it is, even though it's much smaller, its um, its torque is equivalent to the real thing. So okay. it actually has 650 newton meters of torque, which I think is a little bit less than um, their uh, uh, last uh, show of it. I think they they got a little bit more power out of the the higher end one. But it's got three yeah. full, full electric motors. It's got real Tesla battery packs in it now. Um, and it's made of three millimeter stainless, three or four stainless, basically the same thing that the real one is made of. So Fantastic. it's bulletproof, it's hammer proof. The windows are made of polycarbonate, so you can throw baseballs at it all you want. <laughs> um, and it, we, what we did is we actually took this, you know, small little go kart and out towed a full scale Ford F one fifty, like a full My size God. pickup truck, using this little go kart um that's gonna be motor. scary with that much power in that tiny little package yeah it's uh it's very torquey the the thing is in terms of actual power output its top speed is only 30 kilometers an hour okay so we never actually mentioned that in the video but that's how we get so much power is it's geared way, <laughs> way, down. way down uh and we still have um i think it's about 30 horsepower in it so for okay. a go-kart that's still really powerful yeah um and uh, and it's heavy it's a two two and a half thousand pound go-kart okay. basically so <laughs> yeah good towing power for sure so uh but that was a super fun project and we're kind of bringing that back now that the full cyber truck is being released yeah finally um, coming around and um uh, and yeah i'm going from you know giant mechs which is what i spent the last four years of my life doing um you know the power loader the mega hex and uh focusing full-time on the lightsaber nice some cool uh, footage here of it on your screen. This nice little animation of that coming together. Yeah, so we've done a, a bit of exploded views. We also um, I learned how to use visualize on this project and try to make some really nice renderings of uh, the project music as to well. my ears. I'm a huge visualized guy. So I I love doing materials and colors in SolidWorks. I feel like a lot of people that I've met, whether engineers or people that just do it as hobbyists, just keep everything gray. Yeah. And that's always <laughs> bothered me. And I'm like, there you have such powerful tools. You yeah. have such good like visualizations in SolidWorks to be able to um, you know, set the right materials. And then in the future, if you want to use visualize to render it, or if you want to do FE analysis, it's already there. It's already preset. Um, but I don't know. Some people prefer not to use it. I feel like yeah, if you turn off, you know, I know a lot of people are worried about performance, but I've noticed that if you turn off a lot of the higher end performance settings and just keep it on basic colors, that works really well. Totally yeah. agreed. Totally agreed. Got to have so. them there. Cool. Well, I uh, think we're just about at the top of the hour, a couple minutes past, so we can go ahead and get this episode kicked off. Uh, my name is Jesse, and today I have uh, an exciting special guest. Uh, today I have Bogdan from Hacksmith Industries, and he's going to go over some tips, some tricks, some methods of things that he used to build a lightsaber. And I'm not talking about like one of those little stacked cone, like flick out toys that we all had as a kid. No, I am talking about like an actual slash through metal, real working lightsaber. Uh, you may have seen these things on the Hacksmith channel or maybe Mr. Beast video or something like that. They've been all over the place. If I don't have your attention by now, go ahead and turn us off because it really doesn't get any cooler than that or maybe any hotter. They are pretty hot. Uh, so Bogdan, thanks so much for joining us today. How are you, man? It's a pleasure being here. Thank you for the invite. I'm feeling really good. I'm super excited um, to show off some of the stuff that I've been doing. We've obviously been designing lightsabers for 
About seven years now. Uh, I've been on the project for about five. We've gone through a lot of different iterations and every single time I learn something new. So I'm really excited to show this project off and um, kind of talk a little bit about my design process and some of the tips and tricks I use um, to make it easier and to make it scalable long term. So as we make improvements and make upgrades to the lightsabers, um, some of these tips and tricks allow us to get that design quicker and have less errors in both manufacturing and in making engineering changes. Yeah, super cool because I mean, you guys actually built this thing. You're actually using it to like do real lightsaber things. So it's not just like a pretty model that you might download from on the web, right? You guys actually built the thing and it works. They're just the coolest part of this project. Um, absolutely. And if you've seen our videos, I'll do a quick rundown on how it works and what it is. Um, basically, what our lightsaber is, is it's a glass blowing torch at the heart of it. It's a nozzle that uses laminar flow to mix oxygen and propane at the perfect ratios to get a beam that's about three feet long and four and a half thousand degrees Fahrenheit, um, which basically means okay. it can melt through just about any material. And on top of that, if we add extra oxygen to the flame, it can cut through steel like butter just like an oxy fuel cutting torch. That is so cool. At like, you don't even have to be like a Star Wars fan to want a light. Like if anybody jumps in the chat and says that they don't want a lightsaber, we know you're lying. Like I, there's everyone wants a lightsaber that where you could have not even seen Star Wars. You want a lightsaber. This is the coolest thing. Absolutely. And there is actually a lot of practical uh, applications for something like this, um, such as the ability to do search and rescue and, um, you know, breach into uh, to buildings for safety and security or help people get out of really tough situations, similar to like uh, Jaws of Life that they use for rescuing people from cars, right? Oh. Our lightsaber can cut through a car and we have cut through a car with it. Um, so, you know, hopefully through the development of this, we can inspire other people um, to go out and do some crazy stuff that, you know, people tell them is impossible because lightsabers, you look anywhere on a forum and they're like, oh, you can't make a lightsaber. But, you know, we have a lot of uh, ideas in the past and how to get to where we got today. And also a lot of ideas going forward, which is something that I'll be sharing today on how to make it better and more realistic and more like a real lightsaber. Super cool. And this is V2, right? The second version of it you said? This is actually version number seven now. Um, seven. Okay. Yeah, this is version number five of our plasma-based ones. Gotcha. The initial ones use really, really hot metal rods, so titanium tungsten rods that we pass thousands of amps through to get them white hot. Um, but this one is actually basically burning propane uh, at the perfect ratios to get a super hot beam. Um, and the cool thing about this one, as compared to the previous ones, is in the past, in order to get the amount of energy we needed, uh, we had to have a backpack. So we were basically wearing this big, heavy 30 pound backpack with gas bottles and all the electronics and the valves. Uh, yeah, the handle was nice and small, but right exactly. The handle was nice and small, but there was hoses going to the backpack. Not really lightsaber like in the Star Wars universe. They had proto sabers, but after, you know, after time, they developed uh, the real working lightsaber where there is no backpack. And that's where we're headed as well. And that's what we'll be talking about a little more today. Um, I've got some. Pretty cool parts to show you of the current progress of it. Um, and the goal is basically fit that entire backpack, 30 pounds of gas bottles and uh, hoses, wires, and, you know, in the past electronics into something this big. Crazy. Seems impossible. So this right here is the most recent 3D print of the current design. And I can give a little quick uh, rundown. In the front here, we have the nozzle. This is what makes the laminar flow blade. In the center here, we have our fluidics controls um, that are actually gonna control the flow of all the gases and the pressures uh, and make sure that you can turn it on and off safely. Um, on the front here, this is actually the section that we'll be going through some of the design today. There is a vaporizer and some heat pipes in order to um, achieve thermodynamic equilibrium. You see, the system runs on propane and uh, oxygen. And in this case, we're using liquid oxygen to get the density that we need to fit everything into a handle but the nozzle itself runs on gas and we have to basically vaporize both the fuel and the oxygen in order to make sure that the nozzle can operate properly and to do that we have this vaporized on the front where the liquid oxygen will enter heat up boil and the propane will actually vaporize in the tank but we need to keep the tank warm so we have heat pipes that travel from the front to the back of the lightsaber to ensure that both uh, of the fuel and the oxygen 
are vaporized and in the correct state at the correct temperature for the nozzle to operate properly and safely. I mean, it's easy to see why people say, yep, that's not possible. <laughs> you can't fit all of that stuff into a little handle, but that's amazing. You guys did it. Yeah. And, uh, there's a lot of really fun challenges with doing something like this. Uh, not only like material properties in terms of reactivity with oxygen or some of the different fuels, but there's thermodynamics challenges in here. There is, you know, fluidics routing and then making everything really compact. And SolidWorks makes that super, super easy. Um, it allows us to understand and visualize where all the components go, how everything is going to join together, uh, and even plan how the assembly will work out. But in order to do it, um, reliably and quickly and minimize things like um, different bugs with mates. Um, I've got a couple of tips and tricks that I'd like to share on how we actually put this together uh, to make sure that as I'm designing this, as I'm prototyping it, as I'm testing different things, I can make changes in SolidWorks, see how they're going to work out in the real thing and minimize uh, my time trying to go back and forth adjusting parts. Super cool. Yeah. I mean, the, the benefit of being in a parametric situation is that you can make a change and hopefully that propagates through. Right. But sometimes that takes a little bit of forethought to figure out how things are, are going to work to get them to, to mesh together. Absolutely. And uh, I'll kind of try to work through a bit of my thinking. Feel free to stop me at any point. Um, and uh... people are here to see you and lightsabers. So I'm going to try to stay out of the way as much as possible, but <laughs> I uh, make it have a tendency to get a little overexcited. So uh, go ahead. Sounds good. And yeah, I guess uh, one of the last things I'll show um, this actually, uh, people on the stream are some of the first people to actually see this. This is the first half Whoa. of the entire system right there. So this is the real thing as it was modeled, as it was 3D printed um, with the whole vaporizer on the front um, and the fluidics in the middle. You can see there's a little rail there to turn it on and off. Um, you got the heat pipes. As you can tell, the heat pipes that I was using for this one are a little long. So in SolidWorks, I'm going to show you how to be able to change that kind of stuff really, really easily because I've been playing around and experimenting with a whole bunch of different sizes. And that's something that's really important to me is to be able to throw in a different size, see how it's going to fit, figure out what kind of clamps I need to make it hold together properly, um, and then be able to make the real thing and test it as quickly as possible. Super cool. Now, before you even get into that, there was one thing, I think it was in the, the introduction for this maybe, but there was a, a part in the video I remember seeing that I feel like every designer in the world wants to hear. And like James was introducing it or whatever he was going through. And he was like, I gave Bogdan a blank check to design whatever he wants. Like, did that actually happen? You can call him out right here on SolidWorks. Did he actually give you a blank check for this project? Or um, how, did that work, how did that work out? Kind of. So when <laughs> we're, when we're um, pitching this idea, we basically we said, okay, we know that the next step is to make this fully self-contained. And I basically told them, I'm like, the only way we can do that is to increase the density of the fuel and specifically the oxidizer, right? Yep. We need to use liquid oxygen in the next design because that took up like, you know, four feet of the last lightsaber pike. Yeah. Right, no backpack, but it was taller than I was. Sure. Um, and so I basically told them, like, in order to work with liquid oxygen, it's scary. Liquid oxygen ha is super reactive. It can be potentially explosive. It uh, boils off and basically expands, and anything that you're storing it inside could rupture and spill. You know, reactive liquid oxygen absolutely everywhere. Um, so I told them, I'm like, this is rocket science. Yeah. Um, like this right here. It doesn't look like it. It's much smaller than a typical rocket, but the uh, process that's going on here is exactly the same as in a regular rocket from everything from uh, flu fluidics control to the self-pressurizing tanks to the regenerative heating of the nozzle. Um, and I basically said like, hey, if we're gonna do this, if we're gonna work with liquid oxygen, we need to do it safely. Uh, and we needed to actually put together an entire clean room and the infrastructure for working with liquid oxygen is something we've been working on for the last couple of months now since that video. I put together an entire list and I'm like, this is going to cost a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. Like, this is not cheap. We're going to need to consult with proper experts. We're going to need a lot of prototyping time. And we said, okay, well, how do we get that money? Right. As a YouTube channel, obviously we have sponsorships, but if we want to make the best video we can, we need to do that in, you know, a single video. And we need to do that using a sponsorship that makes sense for the video. Right. So I'm such a solid works. Um, but how do we fundraise to be able to set up an entire infrastructure for working with liquid oxygen? And the way that we came to the agreement is, okay, well, we need a product that people can actually be interested in, they can be motivated by, uh, and they can be inspired by uh, in order to, something that's useful in their everyday lives, right? People ask us all the time, they're like, hey, 
can we buy one of these? And it's like, okay, well, this is not only terribly impractical, right? Most people do not need 13,000 watts of heating power in their hand. Uh, your definition of need is different than mine. I'm pretty sure I need one. Um, well, even if you did, the safety of this is very, very important. We do not feel comfortable handing this to uh, to most people. That I, um, I don't blame you there. And, and it's expensive, right? Yeah. Like this prototype, as I said, there were just the R&D cost of this was a quarter million dollars. And in order, if we're only going to sell a couple of these, it doesn't make sense for the typical person to be able to buy a $70,000 product, even when we did try to sell one of our uh, Mr. Beast lightsabers. So we said, okay, we need a product that the average person can uh, can own in their home and actually have that safe and practical and useful. And so we came up with this. Um, these are what we call our mini saber Gen 2s. And basically, these are pocket-sized glow torches. <laughs> These run on just regular butane, just like a regular lighter, that have you know six to eight inch flame, um, and these will cut through pot cans um, and are quite powerful while being very affordable and more practical in everyday life than a lightsaber. Right? You can refill these really easily. They're safe to use. You can use them for lighting campfires. You can use them for making creme brulee. I really like cutting rope with it because if you cut through a piece of rope, it melts both ends and then the rope doesn't fray. So yep. you can own one of these and help actually develop the real working lightsaber. So through supporting us in terms of these mini sabers, that's what allowed us to get the funding we needed to build the entire clean room, to have an, an entire year of my life dedicated to this project and to be able to go through all the steps necessary and safely to you know come up with this design and soon the liquid auction system that's going to make this a fully self-contained handheld lightsaber. Super cool. That wasn't even a shameless plug. I didn't even know that's that's how that worked, but I'm going to need one of those. So yeah, the, the profits of this go directly towards funding this. That is awesome. And like you said, I mean, it is it is rocket science. The goal is just to keep it from becoming a rocket. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> same, same idea. A We're lot of rockets explode. Yep. And it's okay if the rocket is over there and I'm over here. <laughs> Not so okay if I'm holding on to this thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with that. So we're going to try to avoid that at all possible costs. <laughs> That's wise. Okay. So should we get into some of the yeah, design? Yeah, let's get into it. Let's some get of the into it. Design features. So this is the current design um, that I was just showing as a 3D printed system. Um, and one of the current or one of the cool things that I'd really like to share about the design is some of the thermodynamics of the front here and how I designed that to be easily adjustable uh, and easily modifiable for prototyping throughout the generations of the lightsaber. Because this system, thermodynamics is hard. It, it Even if you do all the calculations correctly, um, factoring in things like efficiency, factoring in things like uh, how much actual contact you have, uh, what your uh, transfer capabilities, your thermal paste is, that's really difficult. And SolidWorks does have a lot of really good tools for being able to do this. Um, but the best way to confirm all of your calculations and all of your simulations is to go out and try it. And when you do, you figure out, okay, I need to make this change or I need to make that change. And doing so in an easy and quick manner uh, is really important when you know, you're know you making changes every single week. Um, so something as simple as, as this heat pipe over here, um, I've designed that in a pretty um, unique way and using a couple of uh, tools in SolidWorks that makes it a lot easier to change and test out different designs throughout the generations of the lightsaber and throughout the different prototypes. Cool. So uh, I'll get into to something that uh, like that first and we can kind of move on to the vaporizer after that. Now, it in theory, this seems like a pr pretty simple uh, part and it really is. It's more or less just a regular rectangle, right? Um, so I am usually start with defining some um, horizontal and vertical lines just to show my midpoint of the entire system. Yeah, before um, you even get too far, the infinite length checkbox is a good one that a lot of people even miss, but that can be really nice just for laying out your space, right? I, uh, I was excited to see you use that just then. Yeah, absolutely. And that way, if you have a part, you have to move it side to side, which we will end up doing later. Um, it makes it really easy to do that without losing all your mates. Yeah, totally. like that. Um, and so, you know, you will start off with a regular rectangle. Um, now, I use a lot of hotkeys. Um, I think that's one of the easy things that makes it a lot easier to speed up your work uh, process, right? So for me, like I have R for drawing a regular rectangle, a shift R for doing a center rectangle. Oh, cool. um, and 
that allows me to not have to, you know, move my mouse back and forth every single time I want to open a new tool. Yeah, that's one of the things that I love about SolidWorks is there are so many different ways that you can customize it. You can tune it like however which way you like to work, you can customize it that way, which I, I love. Absolutely. Um, and the default SolidWorks tools are good. Uh, but what I've noticed is it's really easy for me to remember when the letter itself um, represents what I'm working on. Yeah. And so, you know, R for rectangle, O for circle, um, E for extrude, those kinds of um, uh, shortcuts really help me uh, improve my uh, my speed of design. Yeah, that's a, that's so, a great tip in itself. Um, if you see me not moving my mouse up to the corner, I'm probably just using hotkeys. <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll start off with a simple rectangle here. And, you know, we could just go off and um, start dimensioning this as we normally would and do a nice, pretty simple part. Uh, in this case, I'm designing um, this longer heat pipe right here. Um, so that heat pipe is 200 millimeters in length, eight millimeters in width, and three millimeters in height. So, you know, we could go off and make that really, really simple. Um, and there is a general, um, you know, shape of the heat pipe. Now, we're going to add a lot more detail to this and do it in such a way that allows us to easily change it going forward. But one of the things I want to touch up on is with all of my designs, and this could be partially because we make videos about it and uh, it's easier to see, but I feel like it's easier to troubleshoot and figure things out and align things, see collisions and stuff, if the parts are properly colored. So with all of my designs, I love making all the parts um, the right color and being able to easily visualize and see how everything is laid out. And that way, if there's things like right here, there's a collision with that pipe clamp, right? I can easily tell that uh, by the colors blending through. Yep, that's a great point. And I feel like too, just when I'm designing away, when things are looking the way that it's actually going to look in real life, it just like gets me more in the mindset much more quickly when it's looking more realistic like that too. Absolutely. And the way that I usually like to do that is, um, you know, I go into here, I choose material, and I just set it to the actual material that the part will be. And SolidWorks has, you know, great um, appearances for all the materials. So there we go. Now it looks like copper. And I basically did nothing. I clicked two buttons. And now if I ever wanted to, for example, do a thermal uh, simulation on this piece here, then I've already got the material set. And if I ever wanted to do um, a rendering of the entire lightsaber, well, all the materials and all the reflections are properly set off the bat. And I don't have to put in any extra work there. Yep. Totally agree. You got your densities, everything in one, one click. Beautiful. Exactly. So... This rectangle right now is um, just has a couple of simple measurements. And one of, one of the things I'd like to do is be able to make uh, various configurations of this part so that I can uh, change through them in my model as I test different heat pipes. As you can tell, I've got a couple of different ones here. I've got a whole box of them sitting on my desk, but there are some that are shorter, others that are way thinner and narrower. And I don't really know which one is going to give me the uh, the best thermal properties and the best equilibrium. So I have to be able to iterate through and change through them really quickly without breaking my whole model. Um, so in my case here, what I'll do is I'll go into uh, this feature here and I'll make the thickness um, actually a parameter. So I'm going to make a simple variable called height. There we go. And that's going to automatically set us up to three millimeters. And similar in our sketches, I'm going to set this to um, the length. There we go. And this to our width. And those are great tips there, too. Like it, either place that you change it, right, in the dialog box, in the property manager, or in the graphical interface, like you don't have to go hunting into equations and try to, you know, set everything up, you know, so structured right on the fly. You can make those kind of links, which is pretty neat. Exactly. And so now if I needed to change one of those, I just go into the equations and there's my three values there. I can, you know, go in here and make my uh, part shorter or whatever. And actually that's one of the things I'll do next is, you know, in configurations here, if you've ever used configurations, this, these are super useful and they don't have to be complicated. In our, in our case right here, I'll just rename this one to be my 200 by um, eight by three heat pipe. And I'll just go ahead and make another configuration and call this one 150 by 6 by 2. Oh, I'm not there you go, my 6 by 2. Perfect. And so now what I can do in here is go into my equations, manage equations, make sure that I have the correct one selected. I'm just going to go ahead and change all of these to be local configurations. There we go. 
Yeah, and maybe this is something that that people don't even know too, right? Because when you're making your configurations, you don't have to have everything set in every configuration, right? You've got sort of individual control over what you want those things to be doing, whether it's in that con individual configuration or for all configurations or whatever, you have that kind of adjustability too, right? Absolutely, and that makes it super easy that if you have an equation that you want global, you can set that and then all your configurations use that same equation. Yep. Um, whereas in this case, right, I want these to be based on my configuration. So I'm just going to set these to, you know, only be part of this configuration. And then, you know, I can go to the next one. And in here, I'm going to say, okay, well, now my height is two. Uh, my width is 150. Or sorry, my length is 150. And my width is six. And I go into here. Now I can just switch between these two configurations. And you can see there's my bigger heat pipe and there's my smaller heat pipe. And all my faces, all of my edges and vertices, they all stay the same. So if I have something made it to a face or made it to a vertice, um, that's not going to change between these two configurations. Yep. Um, and then if I wanted to make a new one, let's say, you know, I, I was like, okay, well, you know, for a part of the lightsaber, for example, at this section of the front here, Right, this heat pipe is actually interfering with that fitting that I have on the end for the vaporizer. So yep. in this case, I might want to use a shorter heat pipe and I can just make a simple configuration. And then when I go into patterning, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, I can just set a single one of the heat pipes to be a different configuration. And then, you know, that way I can be like, okay, well, I need five of the longer ones and one of the shorter ones. Yeah. And it makes it really easy. Instance um, by instance basis kind of a exactly. thing. Um, and that makes it really easy to you know prototype and see um, and make sure that you have all the right parts before you even start building. Yeah, absolutely cool. It's uh, a comment there. Great, great place for data tables, right? There's a, a ton of different ways that you can go about doing that, right? You are doing that through the equations manager, but you could also like right click on a feature dimension and configure, and then you could see that across the configurations, or you could use a a table like the comment just mentioned. There's there's a variety of ways you could visualize that, if you will. Absolutely. And I know you can also import uh, various spreadsheets in and have an entire spreadsheet of dimensions. Like yep. um, for the giant mech project, the power loader, right? We had like 12 or 13 different hydraulic cylinder sizes. So we could literally just import a, uh, a spreadsheet with every single wall thickness, every uh, stroke, the bore, the thickness of the shaft, have that all be set up through equations and just be able to be, even add, a, you know, add in an extra cylinder. It's like, oh, I need a bigger cylinder, put that into the spreadsheet. And then, you know, automatically I have a configuration of that particular cylinder yep. without having to redesign anything. Yeah, that's a great way to do it too. And that's, um, it's kind of like a, a nice little bit of scale there, right? You know, like, this is a good example of doing this just like on the fly where you're thinking, oh, I have one or two versions of this, but on a, a mass scale, you might be thinking about coming at it for a different approach. If you've got a large number of them to do that, you know, ahead of time or any which way you, you need to do it, you can use the same method. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, if you're doing lots of different production, you're keeping track of multiple different products, then uh, you can use the same spreadsheet that you use for tracking your products to then also um, you know, set configurations for what particular product, what particular, you know, casing dimensions are, um, and stuff like that. Yeah. Very cool. Um, while we're, uh, mentioning a comment here, um, you guys, please do uh, jump in the comments, obviously cool projects. So if you have any, any questions about this particular project, hop in and, and ask them. We're keeping an eye on that as we go. Um, of course, you know, subscribe to the channel. Got to say that um, there was a question in here for you, Bogdan. Um, so where did the where did the idea for the lightsaber come from? Was that your idea or did you have some like experience as a kid where you saw a lightsaber and then that's what you wanted to do? Or where did that where did that come from? So I think initially the idea was not mine. So I'm not actually the one that started lightsabers at Hacks with Industries. That would have been Ian. He's the first one that was like, hey, I think we can replicate something pretty close. And, you know, lightsabers are kind of the pinnacle of science fiction. Yeah. Basically, everybody's heard of Star Wars. And as a kid, I don't know a single person that wasn't like, I want one of those, <laughs> right? Yeah. Those would be so cool. And the other thing is, I feel like they're kind of the pinnacle of impossibility, um, where most of the time you ask someone like, oh, can you make this? And it's like, oh, no, lightsaber is completely impossible. No way. You need yep. a nuclear reactor to power it. You need magnetic fusion confinement. You need this and that. And they just give you a bunch of reasons of why it can't be done. But very rarely do people say, okay, well, here's the particular aspects of it that can be done. 
And I think that kind of like problem solving and kind of figuring out each aspect individually from, you know, temperature to uh, power sources to magnetic confinement and working through those one at a time, you know, with real science and real physics, you can get pretty close to something that resembles what it is in the movies. And that's kind of what we want to inspire. And that fits really well with our content and our channel. Super cool. Love it. All right. Um, Didn't mean to derail us, but no, I saw that. All good. I'm going to want that. I can talk about lightsabers all day. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, and so obviously one of the, the equations in this case, we're just using very simply to store a couple of variables, but we can actually use them um, to uh, add a full equation to be able to do a little more complicated things. So um, in my case here, what I'll do is the actual heat pipes are tapered off on the ends um, and rounded off on, uh, on the corners there. So I want to make sure to represent that accurately in SOLIDWORKS as well. So I can actually just add a regular um, chamfer here, do a 30 degree chamfer. Maybe in this case, we'll do five millimeters, um, but we'll change that using the equation in just a second. And you can see uh, we can add some chamfers in the corners here. And then I'm going to go ahead and with those chamfers done, I'm going to make these equal to chamfer um create that entire new variable and then do the same with all of these and then what we'll be able to do is actually make that a equation um that's based on the length of the part so as the part gets longer or shorter the chamfer there changes uh, appropriately along with it Okay, so we have all those set. Hopefully, there we go. So now we have that. And now in our equations, we can keep this a, um, you know, for all configurations. And we could just say, okay, well, our length is actually just going to be, uh, or sorry, our chamfer is just going to be our length times, for example, um, 0.25%. Oh, sorry, 0.025%. So that's 2.5%. And that's five millimeters. There we go. So now you can see that copper heat pipe. And hopefully if we go to the other configuration, it automatically changes the size of that chamfer there. Um, and then obviously, you know, if we get different brands or different, uh, you know, variations of these heat pipes, you can, you know, add the angle or anything like that as well into it to be able to give a more accurate representation of the real thing. But for now, I think that's a pretty quick and easy way to do it. Yeah, that's super cool. And I feel like that's one of those things, you know, like even just making global variables, it's it's very quick to do, but it's something that people have a tendency and myself included when I'm modeling something up to just be in a rush and say, oh, I'll just, I'll peck in a value for now. But it's, it's one of those things where you, if you slow yourself down a little bit, you end up speeding yourself up because if you know what things you're going to potentially link together at the end, like when you were just there in equations, you can just you know, work with those and say, oh, this is, I know these are, these things are linked at some ratio or whatever. And then you already have that stuff built in. You don't have to go back, try to figure out where you put those dimensions. Obviously in this case, it's a fairly simple model, but when things get more complex, uh, it's, it's a lot uh, nicer to have that already built in because you generally have an idea of what things you're, you might need to use in the future. So if you're building those global variables in as you go, that really will speed things up when you get to towards the middle or end part of that uh, process. Absolutely. And like with things like 3D printing, where like, you know, iteration time is so short, I really like to just make something um, quick, right? Not as focused at, at a huge amount of time on making every individual detail perfect. But while I'm making it quick, make it so that it's easy to change and improve on. Yeah. Right. So rather than spending the time to, you know, get absolutely every single dimension perfect and figure out where are my tools going to go? How am I going to make sure that this screw fits in uh, right off the bat? I just go with something rough, make it easy to change, throw it on the printer. And then, you know, after lunch, the print's done. I can take a look at it and see, okay, this one I need to change. This one I need to change. This one I need to change. And if I've built the, uh, the model from the ground up to make improvements and changes easier, then, you know, I can go through my variables, you know, add, it or, add or change like two or three numbers, throw it on the printer again. And by the end of the day, you know, I have three or four printed prototypes and I make, I make a whole bunch of these right? Uh, I've got boxes and boxes of prototypes yeah. um, because you, with some of the newer printers, like you can get one of these printed in an hour. Um, 
And uh, that means that, you know, the biggest bottleneck now is the designer, not necessarily the prototyping. Um, yeah. So it really helps to um, think ahead of time of like, okay, what changes am I going to likely need to make and plan those into the model to be able to make those changes quickly, easily, and reliably without messing up all of your mates. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great mindset to have. Like it's quick is good, right? You need to be able to like rough something in, but to have the focus more beyond adjustability than speed is uh, is smart because then you can still use the same model to adapt that to hopefully what you're going to need in the, in the end, long game, right? The, the end. Exactly. Um, yeah. And then one interesting thing that I actually did with this uh, model is our heat pipes, uh, I actually ended up bending them on the end there. And now it could be, you know, easy enough to uh, model this from the side view uh, and do that bend inside of that. But also I want to make sure that, you know, the length of this entire piece is constant and um, doesn't, you know, have an impact on the bend radius. Because uh, on the front here, um, you know, those bends are pretty important for making sure we're getting good contact with the flame. And I've been adjusting these all the time. I'll actually put this together, you know, move them in and out of the flame to see how much thermal energy the heat pipes are actually extracting. Um, mm -hmm. And then go back into SolidWorks and, you know, make that change uh, to make sure that my model reflects the real thing. And uh, what I actually found worked really well in this case is turning this part into a sheet metal part. Um, I'm just okay. going to save this quickly. Just make sure that um, we don't have any issues here. Um, oh, that's already. And by turning into sheet metal, I assume you mean you converted? Exactly. So yeah. um, what I did in this case is simply you know, convert to sheet metal, um, click on this, and just give it a material thickness and our bend radiuses. Um, so in this case, I'm not sure which particular configuration I'm in. I'm in the two millimeter configuration, so that's basically perfect. Um, I can turn this entire part into a sheet metal part. And now I can use all of these different sheet metal tools to be able to do things like sketch bends really easily. Yeah, and I suspect that is a tip that actually a lot of people don't know that you can even kind of go back and forth like that. Like you don't have to start in sheet metal to end up using sheet metal tools. There is a way to sort of shoop, slide yourself over into that Segment. Exactly. And you can do the, the exact opposite as well. You can start as a, you know, a shelled part and then unfold it as a sheet metal part. Um, yeah, right. Insert some rips in it and whatever and, and go back the other way. And sheet metal fabrication is so useful. Um, that deserves its own SolidWorks live talk altogether. <laughs> um, but I mean, the only thing faster than 3D printers is laser cutting, especially when we have a laser cutter in house. It's you, just, you can go from a prototype to a laser cut part in a minute. Yeah. Um, and so being able to design using that and kind of think about it that way is really helpful. Um, now, one thing that I did notice in SolidWorks um, is I'm actually not able to um, set the uh, variable here as a, a variable, right? So if I try to do thickness here, um, all right, what was it? It was... Yeah, it doesn't really matter, but you actually can't use variables in um, the convert solid uh, entity. But that's not an issue because um, that's actually not really a huge concern because um, as long as we plan out our uh, our bends and our uh, steps going forward, then we can also just suppress this in our configuration and use a different convert solid for different thicknesses. And that sure. makes it really easy to go back and forth as well. Yeah, that's um, a great point because it adds its own feature into the feature tree. So you have control over that. Exactly. And then that way, if you want to have different bend radiuses or, um, you know, different positioning on the bend, depending on the configuration, you can do that really easily as well. Um, and so the only thing that I would do differently in this case is I would actually add a construction line directly into my original sketch of where I want to do the bend so that I can reference all of my sheet metal parts off of the main sketch rather than off the sheet metal part. Because if I suppress it, then I can't mate to it. But if I use a sketch from the initial sketch that's not suppressed in any configurations, then I can base all of my mates off of that exact same part. That's a great point. Um, so in this case, yeah, I call it 16 millimeters. Um, I can add that line here. Um, and then in, in here, we can simply go to sketched bend, hit the top face of that, um, make our part visible and then just convert entities on this particular part. Hit okay. 
and then we just select the top face. We select our angle. Um, we can also override the bend radius here if we wanted to, you know, did I change where the bend is. In our case, I'm probably gonna start the bend right there. Hit okay, and now we have uh, a bent heat pipe with the correct radius. Um, and this is nice and easy to change going forward. Super cool, I like that. Um, so yeah, similarly, we can now go into our other part right here. And you can see that those got uh, suppressed, but it's easy enough for us to come back into here, convert this into sheet metal. In this case, we can set this to three millimeter thicknesses. Um, and then just do a sketched bend, top face, convert entities. Um, and then do that separately in here, the exact same way as we did before. And now we have two different parameters with the correct thicknesses and the correct bends in the same location. So now it's really nice because um, we can actually use that sketch bend to do some of our mating in the future as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know it's not going to break, right? Because it's it's always built back. Everything's built back off of your starting point. Exactly. And so that makes it super easy. Uh, and that way we can actually just reference to, for example, this line here, if we make a, a plane, and we know we'll always be mating to the start of that bend, uh, even if the bend changes between these two configurations. Very cool. And uh, that also allows us, as I said, to have different bend radiuses in um, our two different um, suppressed features. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's how it is on heat pipes. Uh, typically, it also has some fillets around this, but in this case, that doesn't really, um, you know, help us uh, get through this model. But um, yeah, now we have a heat pipe that I can, you know, buy a whole bunch of different ones and test out and see exactly how they would look in SolidWorks, how they'd fit, what kind of size pipe clamps I need to get them to mount properly um, without having any kind of mate errors or any kind of configuration errors. Dig it. Very cool. So uh, I think next I'll hop into a little bit of that vaporizer because I learned some pretty cool tools You making a vaporizer like this. And I've got a 3D printed model here of what the final part looks like. And this is simply a wound copper coil um, around a mandrel. And in our case, the mandrel is the nozzle itself. Uh, and being able to um, make this easy to change and be able to change how many windings you have, what the pipe diameter is and stuff like that. Um, is also really important to make sure that we get the thermal equilibrium that we're looking for in this lightsaber. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can show off how I designed that because there are some really cool tools that um, I feel like a lot of people know exist, but are kind of scared to use them. And they're actually really easy to use. So I want to kind of go through that really quick and uh, demonstrate that. Cool. Um, so similar to the heat pipes, usually I'll start with a, uh, you know, a general sketch that's going to kind of outline some of the dimensions of um, how this helix is going to work. And I know that my nozzle is actually 26.4, oh, 26.4 millimeters. Um, it's really weird. It, it's not actually exactly an inch. You know, expected to be 25.4, but it's not. Um, and then I like always, to make... Always good to not make assumptions, right? <laughs> exactly. And so again, I can also go into here and say equals um, nozzle OD. There we go. And so now if I use a different nozzle, I can, you know, have the entire um, vaporizer automatically update to that um, really, really quickly. And then here, what I'm going to do is I know that um, I'm going to be testing out a couple of different pipe diameters. So I'll define that in here as well, uh, being the inside diameter wall and the outside diameter wall for the general sketch. So in here, I might make this actually 3 16 of an inch and then turn that into a variable as well. Call it pipe uh, pipe diameter. And then in our case, um, for my coil, I knew I needed quite a bit of surface area. So I actually decided to do a dual uh, or two different helixes, two different coils, mm -hmm. um, so that the fluid can flow up the vaporizer and then back down to the flow regulator. So. Uh, I'll just make these the same by simply turning both of these construction lines to be equal. Um, and so this will be a nice general 
a reference that has my variables in it that I can use for my Helix features. So now we're gonna go into the Helix feature and it's pretty simple. All you really need to do is just draw a circle of the center of the Helix. So in this case, um, I'm gonna draw a circle right about there. And now the center of my pipe will simply be the midpoint of that line. And I can just make that coincident there, hit okay. And now you can see we have our helix. And uh, for our helix, basically we can set our pipe diameter in here as well. I also don't believe you can actually set these two variables. Um, yeah, so that's another feature that, um, you know, it's super powerful, uh, but if we wanna make multiple different configurations of these features, then we need to keep in mind that the pitch will have to be different for each feature. So we can keep that in mind going forward in case we need to make changes there um, to not make things specifically to those two variables and rather cool. make them to the general sketch. And I'll show you uh, how I do that as well going forward. And then, you know, for the height of our piece, I think it's about 80 millimeters. Um, and that way the pitch here is going to be exactly equal to our pipe diameter. So we can get that nice coil wind all the way up. And then there we go, we have a nice spiral. And to make full use of the spiral, um, I'm actually gonna be using the uh, swept boss extrude and then the swept cut to do the inside and outside diameters of our tubes. Okay, um, yeah. One other really useful thing about having the spiral as a single body or a single sketch is that if you click on it, um, it actually, sorry, can you, you can see the, the number down there, right? Or is that? Um, the arc length number, is that what you're referring yes, to? Yes, the arc length. Yeah, yep, yep, we've got that. Okay. Um, so yeah, basically now I know exactly the length of the copper tube that I need in order to wind my coil. So by doing this as a single body, I can click on there and say, okay, I need um, you know that uh, length of tube, go ahead, cut that tube, wander around the mandrel of the determined size, and I'll make sure that I have the exact same uh, like height of my final piece. Yeah, great point. And then, uh, yeah, the, sw the sweep uh, boss and base feature. Uh, in this case, I just, like the tube is just circular. So it makes it really easy because I can just go into circular profile, select my profile to be the helix. I don't wanna be 10 millimeters. Give that a second, sometimes it takes a little bit. Yeah, what a nice addition that was with the circular profile to just be able to click on a path, just make it circular and be done with it. Man, I was so excited when that came out. It saves so much time. Absolutely, especially if it's a really simple thing. Like tubing is, you know, used super, super commonly in a lot of these features. Yeah. So if you're just trying to do tubing, you can have, you know, 3D sketches or anything like that and just make it a circle. You don't have to define uh, any kind of sketch faces and make sure that they're perpendicular to your your lines, it just makes it super easy. Totally. It's a clever way to do some surfacing sometimes too, because you can use that as like a, <clears throat> a surface sweep or something and get that as an e easy offset and ah, all, all kinds of applications. I love it. Absolutely. And I feel like that's kind of why a lot of people uh, are weary of using it is just because they feel like it's very complicated. Yeah. Um, but especially for things like circular profiles, you know, this took me two minutes and now I hit enter and I have the outside diameter of our copper coil. Totally. And actually I should have said that to a variable as well because for the sweep uh, that does work. Um, so I'm just gonna hide this helix and now we have that full copper coil um, in here as well. So now I'm just gonna set that to copper. And uh, in order to accurately represent that coil, I can also just do a sweep cut. Um, again, circular profile. takes just a second. And then I'll be able to actually cut the inside diameter of our tube um, to make sure that we can see how the actual tubing goes through and we can see the things like the wall thicknesses. Yeah. Um, now, is there a reason you do that in two? I think um, I should have been paying attention when you're doing the original one, but I think you could do um, like a thin feature or something on the first one too. Do you like having them in separate features? Um, yeah, I guess the thin features do work as well. Um, I was doing a lot of uh, playing around with like different wall thicknesses and stuff like that. And um, it was working for me. So yeah, I know that with thin features, sometimes if you have specific geometry, like sharp corners or anything like that, um, it'll often um, throw some kind of air, like some errors. And this way it's a lot easier to troubleshoot where the error is coming from if it's in a specific feature on its own. Isolated, yeah. 
Um, so yeah, in this there's case, always a bunch of different ways to do things. That's all it works. You could shell it. You could throw another yep. feature on there. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, in this case, I'm just going to make that an eighth of an inch. And again, I can set that to be um, equals pipe ID. Sean is producing and also saying in the chat that you know, you probably know more about what can be set to a global variable than anybody. I tend to agree. <laughs> um, so actually, I did not check one of the features in here. I have to make sure that it's connected to the faces. So I'm just going to go back right into here. And then here, it, it does start on one rotation lower. So in order to just change that, we align with the end faces. OK, yep. And now we have our copper pipe here. Super cool. Give that just one second. And there we go. So for me, especially, this is doing a pipe like this. It's also super useful because it's a single feature. It's a single body. And that also makes it really easy for me to just measure the inside uh, area of this pipe. So I can yeah. see it right there. There's the internal area of the pipe. And this is really important for me when I'm doing the thermodynamics calculations because I need to know the conductivity of copper and how much contact it's making with liquid oxygen to figure out how much heat I can actually transfer into the oxygen. Yep. Um, and I can kind of work back from that and say, okay, I do have enough surface area. I do have enough thermal conductivity to make sure that all my oxygen can boil off properly. Um, whereas if this had multiple different faces, if this was done as uh, a patterned, uh, you know, just like disc or a ring, it'd make it a lot harder to sum all that up together uh, really easily. Yeah, definitely. And to get that, you're just using the measure tool, right? Exactly. So uh, yeah, that, that would be in evaluate evaluate measure. Yeah. There it is. So then you can just click on the inside of that. And we have that area there. Very cool. So similarly, now I can do, you know, a second one of those on the outside perimeter. I don't think just for time reasons, I'm going to repeat all that steps again, but I could do a whole second circle, a whole second spiral and have them be, you know, different pitches. Um, have them or adjust this measurement here to have them inset into each other a little bit so that I, in this case here, I have them nesting almost perfectly. Okay. Yep. Um, so that I'm getting as much thermal conduct uh, or the conductivity between the inside pipe and the outside pipe. Um, and so doing it this way allows me to play around with how much gap I have between each individual coil, uh, how much gap I have between uh, the material, and also determine things like if I was to inlay a uh, brazing wire for brazing this whole thing together, do I have enough space there? What gauge of brazing wire I should use makes it really easy. And, uh, you know, doing a cross-sectional view there allows us to see how that pipe is all wound together and you can see all the individual windings there. Very cool. Um, now I, we're, I guess we're getting a little bit close on time, so I should, I should probably let you move on to, um, patterns here, but one question just in, in this, you've got these two stacked, um, helixes. How mm -hmm. did you go about tying the two of those together? Did you end up just using like a 3d sketch and then sweeping between them? Or how did you connect the tubing on those transition pieces? Actually? Yeah. So initially the very first one that I did of these, I did actually use a 3d sketch and I basically just made a plane that was, uh, on the face of the end of this tube here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so on the end of that face right there, and then I basically just made an arc that went between the two, uh, that was tangent to the inside diameter of the tube. Um, and that worked really well. Um, but in the final revision, what I realized is I cannot bend tube, uh, at that radius. So for okay, the final yeah. one here, I actually ended up just machining a little brass piece. Oh, my apologies. Uh, ended up machining a little brass piece on the end okay. there that could be brazed onto both ends. So in my model, I actually have both ends just open. Um, to allow that part to brace onto it. Got it. Cool. Um, actually, in this one here, yeah, in this one there, I don't know if you can see how there's oh, a little yeah. U-bend connecting yep. the two together. Yep. Um, and then similarly, um, for doing the tubing like this, so actually showing off the tubing run between the copper heat pipes and showing off the tubing get a little bit wider. Um, 3D sketches work really well for being able to continue that contour and continue the, the line on whatever arc or whatever tangency you want in 3D space because this tube, it gets wider and moves down and moves out. Um, so getting that to align properly makes it really easy to use uh, 3D sketches and then actually relate that in the assembly as well. Yeah, very cool. Um, 
And then, yeah, let's put some of these together. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually create a couple of really quick meeting features um, even before I put the assembly together, just to make sure that I can meet these uh, effectively. And so in this case, one of the things I know I want to do is I want to make the pipe tangent to the face. But sometimes when you have multiple different faces um, or multiple different bodies, uh, the getting the tangency correct on the correct side and the correct orientation can be a little bit of a hassle. And then if you change or delete a body, um, that can cause made errors. So what I like to do is reference it off of the sketch. So in this case, I know that that dot right there is going to be the outside diameter of a tube. And I can simply make a plane that is um, coincident with that point and parallel to the vertical plane. And now we have a plane that's basically tangent to our circle. Yeah. And yeah, that's a great method too, because especially with a helix like this of, of piping, because you're really only getting like point contact there. So it's that's a tricky one to begin with. So yeah, and using a play now, I can use a standard coincident mate, which are very reliable and very easy to change in the future. And then yeah. if I need to space it out to add some extra material or to account for my thermal epoxy, then all I have to do is um, either move that point or make a second plane off of this one um, that's spaced off really easily. Yeah, it's good thinking. Um, all right, let's uh, throw this into an assembly. Um, now, one of the other things that I like to do that I don't know if many people do is initially when you import the very first part in SOLIDWORKS, this part is fixed. This part can't move. But depending on where you dragged and dropped it, it's actually not uh, related to the um, uh, the main planes, or not necessarily related in the main planes um, in here. So what I like to do is just make that float really quickly and match the front to the front here. Make that into a mate. Match the right to the right here. Yeah, and you'll get different behavior too, right? If you just like just click the checkbox, like just select the component and click the checkbox, versus if you drag and drop it, you'll get you'll get different things that happen there, right? So always a good idea to check and and make sure you're centered up. Absolutely. And so now I know that I can mate either to um, this body right here or this uh, component here, or I can mate to the assembly itself, and they're going to be in perfect alignment. And this doesn't go, go anywhere anymore. Yep. Great. Um, all right. And then let's just name this, call that assembly two for now. And then we can insert our heat pipes here. And in this case, we'll just select the large configuration. Um, and we can hide some of these sketches to make it a little easier to see. Now we could also hide the sketches in here. Um, go in here and just hide all the sketches. And now we can simply mate our front to that plane that we created in here. There we go. And that's going to be coincident. And then we can mate our center line of this body to the center line of, in this case, I'll just do the assembly in case we need to move this anywhere. Um, the assembly will stay the same. Yep. Um, and then in this case, I think my bottom is actually the opposite way around. Yeah. So we'll just make that to, in this case, I don't want to actually make to this because this is a different feature um, in the two different assemblies of this. So in this case, what I'll do is I'll actually make to um, my sketch here. So in this sketch, I have, um, turn this back on. I have made that line there. So now I can just use this, for example, and made that to my top here. So that way, regardless, regardless of which, um, which uh, configuration I decide to use for these heat pipes, the mate is always going to stay the same. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like how intentional you are about setting up those um, mates because I think a lot of people have a tendency to just click on whatever you can see, which works, right? And if you're not needing to change anything, maybe it makes no difference at all. Um, but just a little bit of thinking ahead might really save you quite a bit of time. Exactly. And then this does not want to have me mate the flip the mate alignment though. Let's just suppress this for a second. Okay. As I was saying, sometimes uh, fun errors do occur. Let's see, what did I mate here that it did not like? We had uh, Eric 
Eric was in the chat giving tech support before. Maybe he was watching closer than I was. Um, no, no, that one coincident. Let's try to flip this. Okay. Perfect. There we go. So and all of these things really kind of stack on top of each other too, because, you know, like having the ability to use this mate here is a result of you thinking ahead when you were building the part, knowing that you're building it for configurations and subsequently was going to go into the assembly. So the, it, it's like the decisions that you make sort of propagate through that whole process, right? You're already thinking ahead when it comes to the part. And then when you get it into the assembly, you're taking advantage of what you've already thought ahead for on that. So they just kind of like stack up and snowball into a more and more robust model the further along you get, which is cool. Exactly. And so I'll make one change later that'll show how all of that can uh, can work well together. We don't have a huge amount of time, but the pattern itself is a super easy tool to use. So in this case, I don't have a center axis. So I'm just going to create that using my right and my front plane. I'm just going to get a center axis going through here. And then we can simply just do a circular component pattern around that center axis, mirror this component here, throw six of these together. And now we have a nice and easy, perfectly tangent a set of heat pipes, just like in the actual lightsaber. Cool. Um, now, the one thing that I was saying that's kind of cool is let's say I wanted um, to have one of these heat pipes be different. Currently, they're all, all the origins are in the center. So this is going to uh, move out of the way, but I can just change one of these heat pipes to the smaller one. No, oh, not that one. Let's just change that one back real quick. I think that was the main one that I patterned. The seed one. <laughs> yeah. It's always. <laughs> So let's, guess, guessing game. let's do let's do this one here. I can go ahead and change this to be different configuration, and there we go. So now that's a different configuration. And the thing is, it um, changed the size based on the center point of that sketch. But it's really easy for us to actually adjust that sketch because now, if you go into here, um, I can go into our sketch, and rather than using the center point as the middle of our part, uh, I can get rid of some of these. Um, I don't want to make, okay, let's just get rid of that as well. So there's a plethora of, uh, coincidence in the, <laughs> when, when you've got your center lines in there. Yep, exactly. Uh, we'll make those in just a second. I'm just going to select the make point of that. Eric was just saying in the chat, good, good example of design intent, which is what we were talking about last week on live design. Absolutely. Um, there we go. Make these two coincident. Perfect. And then. And now, again, to your, to your point earlier with your infinity lines, it doesn't even really matter where things are going. They're, uh, they just keep right on going and don't care. Exactly. So now, now both of these configurations are, have the origin at the bend point. Yep. Um, and that's where we're used for the mate. So now if we go into our assembly here, hopefully. If everything worked out, the mate for that smaller heat pipe is exactly in the same position as all the other ones. So now we can go back and forth between changing this to be a different size heat pipe. Or for example, if we had our local pattern, let's say we said, okay, well, I need more heat pipes. And this is actually a problem that I'm having right now. The heat pipes that I have are great for the fuel, but they're not enough for the oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, so I can go into here, I can make 12 of them. And then you can see, okay, well, now these are hitting each other. So we obviously can't use these large heat pipes, but then I can go through and say, okay, well, in that case, every other one of these heat pipes, um, let's just make these smaller. And there we go. So now we have the same pattern, but we're using configure. We're taking advantage of configurations to allow us to use the exact same pattern feature with multiple different styles and sizes of heat pipes. Absolutely. That is super cool. Yeah. And that's, that's a great, great example um, of how all those things stack together. I love that. So yeah, um, that's uh, one, of the, one of the ways that I, you know, take advantage of a lot of the um, equations, the mating features and, um, you know, as you said, design intent to kind of think about, okay, how am I actually going to build this? What kind of things are going to need to change or what kind of things am I uncertain about? And how can I uh, plan my uh, my equations, my components or uh, configurations, and my mates 
to allow me to make those changes really quickly, really easily, and without um, breaking the model. Super cool. I love that. Yeah, I think my uh, my takeaway from from the episode is just that focus on changeability almost more than anything uh, is really what speeds up the entire process as you're as you're going. Like just extensive use of your global variables. I love that. And the other thing that I think is really useful about doing it this way is if I'm handing this off to someone like Ben, who's going to be machining some of these parts for me, and he's like, oh, well, I can't get to that radius. Rather than having to go through the entire uh, feature tree and figure out, okay, well, which one of these is the correct radius? Oh, if I change that, it breaks the rest of the model because it's using that radius as a reference. If I set that radius up as a equation, then he, I can just tell him like, okay, all the important dimensions you might need to change are all in equations. Yep. And if he's figuring out the cam for this part, he can go through that and say, okay, well, this radius is too short or, short or too, too big or too small, and my mill doesn't fit through there. He can go into the um, the equations and just see, okay, the corner radiuses make all of them bigger. And it updates everything and all the references stay the same. Yeah, and that's a great point too, because um, I would suspect most of the people on on the line here with us are not designing in a bubble, right? Usually you end up having to work with somebody, like somebody even to your point has to machine it. Either you're working with other designers or somebody who's who's on the shop floor um, mm -hmm. ends up having to interact with your model. The smarter that you can make that model or the easier it's gonna be, the, the whole process for everybody gets a whole lot smoother, and especially if it's a model that's set up to be robust and you're not having to go through and, oh, I made this change and now this changed that and I gotta go back and fix that. If those things are set up to be truly parametric, then the whole process goes a whole lot smoother. Exactly, or if you know, someone, one of your coworkers changes a particular feature and doesn't realize that that's part of a bigger assembly, then you come back to your assembly the next day and you're trying to figure out who changed what yeah. and which particular feature in the dozens of features you have in your tree was the one that's responsible. Here you could be like, okay, well, you know, I know that he likely changed the equation itself. You go in there and it's easy enough to change it back or, um, you know, uh, uh, affect your model uh, to not break in the first place. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, uh, that was awesome. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah, so I know we only covered a couple of small features. Um, there's a couple of other things that I did want to talk about, so I don't know um, how we're doing for time here. Yeah, sure. We got a couple minutes if you want to if you yeah. want to go for it. I think another interesting feature that I just started using on this particular lightsaber is Flex, because I had these um, these uh, tiny little heat sinks, which I was initially planning on putting around the outside of the lightsaber around here, okay. and I wanted to make good. Uh, uh, thermal contact with the coil. So I don't want them to be tangent. I do actually want to bend them around. Uh, and my plan was to actually make a little 3D printed uh, mold that I can put these inside and crimp the, the, them together. But for that, I needed to get the correct uh, bend radius on each one of these parts. And I wanted to be able to change that bend radius so that if my vaporizer changes, I don't have to go and redraw every one of these heat sinks. Um, and okay. yep. So what I came or what came across is, uh, you know, I decided to use Flex for the first time, and it actually made it really easy. Um, and basically, with the Flex feature, you can um, select a particular face um, or a particular body, and then just say, okay, well, I'm going to bend it by this angle, or I'm going to bend it by this radius. And you know, what this part was initially a uh, perfectly flat part, just like so. And we added in this flex feature here to basically say, okay, well, I'm bending it by the radius of the part and across the, in this case, uh, the Y axis. Yep. And it allows me to basically just match the radius of my part so that in my assembly here, um, this one here, um, we have good contact on that entire copper heat sink. So cool. And I would suspect you said, you know, people might be scared of a sweep. If people are scared of a sweep, flex is even more so. <laughs> that is definitely a tool that people would avoid going into. Uh, Eric in the chat is claiming that it's 100% his favorite little known feature. Though I'm getting sus suspicious. I, I feel like Eric says everything is his favorite feature. So I'm not sure that I'm confident that he's telling the truth here. But there we'll, have, is we'll take his word on it. There, it's a very powerful tool. As from it's what I understand, cool. you can do a lot of really complex geometries uh, as solid bodies by using Flex. 
Um, but if you're really only trying to focus on doing one bend or one particular angle and trying to have that be even and consistent around a particular radius, it's actually really simple to uh, to do just a single axis bend or a single axis flex. Um, so I'd say give it a try because um, that saved me a lot of time when I was playing around with different sizes of heat sinks and different sizes of heat pipes and different sizes of vaporizers, trying to get that radius to be the same every single time. Uh, makes it really easy for that to just be a single feature instead of an entire new sketch uh, or an entire new geometry for every single type of heatsink. Totally. That's a super cool application for it. I, I will be honest, I don't think I would have thought of that. I like that one. And uh, similarly, another really easy tool that I used, uh, let me see if it's actually in here. It should be in there. Yeah, the bent cavity. So what I actually did in this case is I simply made a box around the end of my um, uh, my heat pipe, and then I simply used the um, the where was it the combined feature to subtract the um, body of the heat pipe from the body of the rectangle, and then I uh, split that up into multiple different bodies and recombine them again to give me basically a cavity yep. of um, the entire part. No, there's actual cavity features, um, but this one was just super simple to use. I had the separate bodies, and what it, this allows me to do is now I can 3D print this little cavity uh, and then use that so that every single one of my heat pipes that I bend is exactly the same angle. There's no um, sharp bend on the inside. Like if I was to try to use a brake or a, a vise to bend this, I would get a um, like a pinch on the inside of that pipe. In this case, that allows me to have a nice consistent radius and I can adjust the radius by just adjusting my heat pipe itself and then auto generate the mold that I need to make a consistent bend every single time. Yeah, that's super cool too. And I mean, obviously, like you said, there there is the core and cavity tools, but I'll be honest, I do this most of the time anyway. If it's, you know, if it's not something that you need to go like build a crazy mold on, combine is, a, is an excellent way. It's quick and dirty stuff for like the, you know, this kind of thing is absolutely perfect. And I also noticed you were using a tab to show and hide bodies. Is that what you're doing there in the background? Uh, yes, so I'm using tab and shift tab in my case to yep. show and hide bodies. And that makes it really useful. Excellent tip to there be able too to on, the, on multi-bodies as well as assemblies. And the nice thing with this is if I end up changing my, uh, my main heat pipe uh, and make it bigger or smaller, my cavity automatically updates with that as well. You so are the linking master, my man. Makes it really easy to um, be like, oh, I need a bigger heat pipe, throw this on the printer, or to the pipes and the next day I have um, the correct bends, the correct radiuses and all my mates stay proper. Super cool. Well, that is I love in, all your thinking unless, ahead. That is, is unless I hide or change all of my bodies. But yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, my lightsaber design philosophy and how I've been getting used to it. And again, this isn't something that happened overnight. This is the seventh iteration of lightsaber that I've done now. Um, so over time, I've started using more and more and more of these and realizing, okay, don't mate to this, do mate to that. And hopefully me sharing a little bit more of that today um, allows other people to think a, a ahead of the model a little easier and save themselves a lot of time um, when they're designing complex geometries and parts. Yeah, and that's a great point too. I mean, we were talking about that last week. And, um, Mike Sandy and I, a coworker, we were talking about design intent last week on the show too. And it, <clears throat> it's something that we talked about too. You know, it's like you just develop these little things over over time. You build a model, and then the next one you build is even better because you realize, oh, okay, I can do this, that, and the other thing to make this one better or smooth, go smoother or whatever. Um, so you you build up those things. But the nice thing about these tips is that they kind of are universal across any kind of modeling process, right? You can use anything that we talked just talked about today is not specific to building a lightsaber, right? You could use every one of those on any model that you build. It's just the, the philosophy of it um, that, you know, things you pick up in, in building those models, but then you can apply it to every model that you build forward, which is what's so valuable, I think, about these, these kinds of tips. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, hopefully that makes it easier. It makes, uh, you know, people that are a little newer to SolidWorks um, less scared of some of these features that sound really complex, um, but can actually save a lot of time and are honestly pretty easy to use. And yeah. you know, SOLIDWORKS has a great amount of documentation on all of these as well. And there's so much more that each one of these features can do than what was shown today. Um, 
but you know, knowing the basics and getting started with it and using it in everyday design really helps build that confidence. And then when you do need the uh, full power of a flex feature, for example, you already know how the feature works, what kind of parameters it has and how you can incorporate that into your design. Yeah, absolutely. You can kind of work your way into it and build the complexity as you go. Very cool. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, man. I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this just uh, by scanning through the chat. It, it looks like everybody really enjoyed it as well. So I really appreciate you coming on, showing us the project. Obviously, amazingly cool project, and we can't wait to see the the next iterations of it when uh, V8 comes. We'll have you back on and see how that one turned out as well, I guess. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Well, thanks guys for joining us today. Uh, hopefully you had as much fun as I did. I'm sure you did. Like I said, based on the, the chat, um, thanks for, thanks for coming in. Thanks for leaving your comments on there, Eric. I see you're, you're saying you're totally, uh, totally telling the truth on the flex feature. So I'll take your word for it. Um, Coming up on the show, of course, uh, if you were with us last week, we mentioned that we have um, an episode coming up uh, regarding World. World is sneaking up on us like crazy here, obviously coming up in February in Dallas. Uh, so we've got an episode coming up for that. We have um, a session that's going to go through some of the, the technical previews from that um, that event. I absolutely can't wait um, to, to see you guys there. If you haven't uh, registered for that already, of course, go over to 3D Experience World um, to register. It is absolutely worth going to those events. I always learn a ton of stuff while I'm there. Um, and I, I absolutely love love the event. It's one of my favorite things to do every year. So I hope hopefully we'll see all of you guys there. And um, this session will give you a little bit of a taste of what's coming up in the, you know, hundreds of SolidWorks sessions that you can attend while you're while you're at World in Dallas. So uh, definitely sign up for that so you can see what's coming and, uh, and hopefully I'll see you there. And of course, Subscribe to the channel uh, for more live design and for SolidWorks Live and for Manufacturing Live. We're always on here talking about something cool. So uh, thank you for joining us today, and we will see you on the next one.